Good afternoon. The Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee will come to order. Today is March 15, 2023, and we do have a quorum present. Uh, members, we are going to start with Senator Rest. I'm going to let you know we may be moving some provisions around on the agenda order to accommodate uh, member absences and other commitments as we're kind of coming and going a little bit. Uh, but either way, we're starting with Senator Rust. Senate File 2264. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate File 2264 are the um, uh, um, data practices and provisions of the Department of Revenue's uh, uh, policy and technical bill. And so the representative from the agency is here to go through it with you. Ms. Bears, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Joanna Bears, and I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Um, we first want to thank you uh, for letting us present today on Senate File 2264, and then also uh, thanking Senator Rust for authoring this bill. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's common practice for the Department of Revenue to put forward proposals each year that have no fiscal impact. This is what we call our policy and technical bill. And these proposals address policy and technical issues that improve the quality of tax administration by clarifying or updating the tax code. The four, the four proposals in this bill do just that. Section 1, 2, and 7 move existing law regarding interagency data sharing authority from session law to statute. This will make our existing authority clearer for receiving data from state agencies for the preparation of databases needed for the tax instance study and the property tax burden report. Both of these studies provide policymakers and taxpayers with important information on the distributional impacts of Minnesota tax policies. Section 3 amends our statute under which the department is required to publish the names of paid preparers who have violated various state laws to include a preparer who has been penalized for failing to include the unique federal preparer tax identification number they are required to have when they file returns uh, on behalf of their clients. Section four, this amends our property tax refund program to require landlords or property tax managers who issue a certificate of rent to provide their taxpayer identification number to the department when there's electronic filing of the certificate with the department. Currently, we are working on developing an online filing system for property tax refunds for renters. This would be similar to our homestead property tax refund that we have online. Uh, in order to complete this process, we do need the landlord or property tax manager or the person who's responsible for issuing the certificate of rent paid to register with our e-services program so they can file their certificate electronically. The taxpayer identification number is only or is for registering or accessing, uh, accessing our systems. The issuer does not actually put it on the certificate of rent paid that's sent to the renter. And then section five and six provide clarifying changes in order to comply with the IRS requirements for providing Minnesota state agencies with federal tax information, including requiring national FBI criminal history checks for anyone who will have access to such data. In the 2021 tax bill, there was language that provided this authorization for state agencies uh, that did allow us to comply with federal requirements. However, when we submitted the enacted legislation to the US Department of Justice for their review, uh, they had some minor suggestions uh, on our language, and so we have made those updates based on their feedback, and then we'll submit this language uh, after this is enacted. Uh, that concludes our four items. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bayers. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing anyone. Any members of the committee have any questions or discussion? Not seeing anyone. So, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten, would you like to make the motion to re refer this bill to the Tax Committee? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. Senator Umu Verbaten moves that Senate File 2264 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Tax Committee, where I have no doubt it will get a hearing. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Rust. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next on the agenda, Senate File 302, Senator Mann.
Senator Mann, why don't you describe the bill to us? And we have uh, two testifiers, one of whom is virtual uh, today, and then uh, we will entertain your A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the uh, I will briefly mention the amendment as well while we're talking about it. Uh, it is partly technical. It updates some cross-references, and then the other piece of it is that it adds some more payer data to our collection information. Uh, it also makes sure that this data is not made public, and this is designed to make sure that we as policymakers have the best information available uh, to understand what we pay for in healthcare and how we are paying for it. Now, as far as 302 as a whole, this will expand the use of the All Payers Claims Data, or the APCD. The APCD was created by the legislature in 2009 to see what we were spending our healthcare dollars on. It shows us where we spend the money, what healthcare services are being delivered, and how they were paid for, to what extent, extent the services offered are affordable, and how efficient the system is, and how much waste is in our system, uh, among other things. Currently, we are one of 17 states that use a similar database. Uh, however, we currently have some holes in our data collection. For example, we are missing dental health care data, and about 50% of commercial data is also missing. We are also currently missing a large piece of the pie, and that is value-based payments, uh, which includes things like infrastructure costs, patient support services, and payments made in regards to value of care versus volume. And lastly, we are missing racial data, as in who is the money being spent on. So this bill simply adds those pieces of information so that we can get a more clear picture of where our healthcare dollars go. Um, healthcare spending is growing faster than inflation, and we need to make sure that we are equipped with the proper and full scope of information so that we can prevent this system from one day potentially collapsing on itself. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, we do have testifiers. We're going to start with our virtual testifier, that is uh, Dr. Nicole Chason from the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. Doctor, please correct me if I mispronounced your last name. Try to find a balance between the French or French-Canadian pronunciation and the American pronunciation. So uh, go ahead, identify yourself for our record, please, and note your filling. No problem. Thank you, Chair Lutz and committee members. Yes, my name is Nicole Chason. It got anglicized, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm a family physician from St. Paul, and I am testifying in strong support of Senate File 302 on behalf of the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. We are the largest physician specialty organization in Minnesota with more than 3,100 family physician, resident physician, and medical student members across the state. Minnesota's all-payer claims database has been an invaluable tool since 2008 to analyze variations in healthcare costs and quality, study hospital readmissions and trends for specific chronic conditions and more. Senate File 302 is needed to update the APCD and ensure that it collects um, a complete picture of how health care is paid for in Minnesota. Currently, the APCD only collects payments that are found on an insurance claim. It's missing a large portion of payments, such as non-claimed um, claims-based payments that include value-based payments, infrastructure costs, care coordination, other patient support services, such as um, Senator Mann has mentioned. As we all work to ensure that all Minnesotans have access to high quality, affordable health care, both national and international data shows that a greater investment in primary care and prevention results in better care and lower costs. However, before Minnesota can move forward with all of that, we need a clearer, more comprehensive picture of health care spending in our state as a whole. We need to capture all the ways that we are paying for healthcare to understand how to make our healthcare system work best for the people it serves and to ensure that we are getting value for our spending. Without this data, how do we, policymakers, healthcare team members, and patients set a vision for a system that works for Minnesotans? Senate File 302 also directs the Commissioner of Health to use that updated APCD data to report to the legislature about the volume and distribution of health care spending with a particular focus on value-based care models and primary care spending. Family physicians and other primary care providers are critical as we embrace a value-based care delivery and payment model that recognizes the importance of prevention, addressing health disparities, and keeping people healthy. Data from the Primary Care Collaborative and Millbank Foundation show that investing more in primary care actually lowers healthcare costs and results in higher patient satisfaction. 
and it correlates with fewer hospitalizations and emer emergency department visits. Yet a recent MDH study of claims only data showed that only about 6% of healthcare spending goes to primary care in Minnesota. So again, we need to have a more complete picture of healthcare spending in our state to truly understand our needs and our gaps. Senate file um, 302 is critical to you as policymakers to know how healthcare is currently paid for in Minnesota and to help inform any next steps that we make with our healthcare payment system to help it work best for our state and for Minnesotans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chasen. Uh, Stephen Gildemeister, Minnesota Department of Health. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Mr. Chair, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Stefan Gildemeister, and that's not anglicized yet. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, am, I direct the Health Economics Program in the Minnesota Department of Health, where we conduct research to support policymaking on uh, a range of activities from healthcare costs to access to quality, uh, disease burden, etc. cetera. Um, and it's our team that uh, maintains the database and currently uh, the, the only team that uses the data um, per, per the statute. I am primarily here, uh, Mr. Chair, to answer questions, but, but I wanted to, um, uh, by way of introduction, sort of recognize uh, what, what um, Senator Mann has said and the, your first testifier has said, the investment that the Minnesota made in the APCD was really to um, uh, support the state in developing evidence-based health policy and uh, ensuring or looking for ways to ensure that healthcare delivery uh, 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 continues to be of high quality and affordable. Um, so um, with a number of other states maintaining these data, Minnesota is certainly among the visionaries here in the national context. And also um, wanna uh, acknowledge that the bill is not an administration bill, uh, but there are a number of components in that that are part of the governor's budget, um, primarily the collection of race ethnicity data and the dental claims data. Nevertheless, I think um, I wanna acknowledge that uh, the vision that Senator Mann has in her bill to, to make the data uh, um, um, more comprehensive and use of the data more effective is, is, is something that's really important to acknowledge. Um, and I think with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gildemeister. Um, is there anyone else in the uh, audience that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing any. Any questions or discussion from members of the committee? Uh, members, this is essentially before us because of all the data implications. Uh, so data practice is jurisdiction of our, of our committee. Um, Senator Limmer, one of our data practices experts on the committee. <laughs> you're, you're very generous, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. You Don't set worry. me up. Don't worry, I'll get you back. Um, I know that too. <laughs> on page three, we make reference to chapter 13, uh, or section 13 as it's referenced. Um, uh, chapter 13 is an area of law that involves our data privacy. Uh, we try to uh, make references to it as we write law so that it's kind of in one area that, that people can study. Uh, as I look at this bill, and I am just quickly scanning it right now, all of the sharing of data uh, that this bill requires, is it under the authority of Chapter 13 or in, sometimes in Chapter 144 or Section 144? Uh, that involves all of the medical data, the Health Record Acts, uh, that this information uh, it would be illegal for someone to uh, ignore or bypass our privacy laws. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is, is the individual protected? Is their health records protected as this information gets passed from one agency or entity to another? I see on line 3.21, the commissioner 
can advise or, or a third-party administrator shall submit to a private entity. Uh, that's not a government agency, so does that same protection follow the information and is it protected? Can you assure me of that? Thank you, Senator Wimmer. Um, do you have anything to uh, respond with? Madam Chair, uh, Senator Limmer, I am not a data practices expert, but I, I think I can answer you a question. Um, nothing in the bill, as I understand it, really changes the underlying data practices in, in 62U04. And, and a couple of things to note. Uh, the data are required to be de-identified. So essentially, um, we don't have in the data identifiable information such as name, social security number, address, um, the, 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 um, so that in some ways, uh, that intentionally protects the identity of individuals. Um, in addition to these statutory provision and the reference to uh, chapter 13, um, we are governed by other practices and, and requirements. So uh, the data includes Medicare data, and we obtain that data through a data use agreement with the federal, uh, with CMS, the, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, which requires us to abide by certain uh, laws and best practices, uh, NIST, HIPAA, uh, et cetera, small, uh, governing small cells and things like that. So that's one element that gov governs uh, these data. I think the second element governing these data are um, uh, MDH as a public health agency is not a HIPAA, um, uh, um, is not subject to HIPAA, but in establishing these data 15 years or so ago, we were guided by, by HIPAA requirements uh, and, and, and other best practices. So if I were to summarize the protections beyond uh, what's, what's uh, those that you referenced, um, we have administrative, technical, uh, and physical um, uh, um, protections in the data and organizational practices that further protect the data. And I, if, if you're interested, I can go through some of them. But they represent, uh, they, they acknowledge that these data, even though they're de-identified, de uh, de still represent sensitive information. So the data lives in an enclave that is not directly connected to the internet. Um, layers and layers of protections that we have adopted over time to, to protect these data here in Minnesota. Thank you. It's Mr. Gildemeister. I pronounce your name correctly? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Limmer? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know that um, there's a lot of talk uh, when we get into these subject areas about HIPAA. Um, federal law established HIPAA to protect privacy rights of individuals. Um, that same federal law, and I'm saying this for the benefit of our new members and the public, uh, federal law allows states to write even more stringent uh, protections, which Minnesota has done in a variety of places. Um, I do have a question for our council. Uh, on page four, lines one through three, uh, there's a reference that reads, the commissioner shall, shall establish procedures and safeguards to protect the integrity and confidentially, confidentiality of any data maintained by the commissioner. Uh, my question to counsel is, should we make a reference to Chapter 13 and Section 144 and any other areas of law and write it in, or it, does this... Uh, this reference, I've never seen it uh, written this way, that a commissioner is, is the one, I suppose that's where the buck stops. But uh, nevertheless, is it written and conforming with what we have in existing law? Ms. Primo. Does it, does it need a cross-reference? Mr. Chair and members, um, this data system currently, state repository currently exists um, under law and 
that's that language um, currently exists in other um, in current law with respect to other data that is currently collected. So if you look at um, lines three point six to three point eight. Um, it includes the same sort of requirement for the commissioner to establish those procedures and safeguards. And this state repository would be subject to any protections under Chapter 13 um, with the caveat that the specific uses that are authorized under current law as well as uh, being authorized in this bill would work together with Chapter 13. Okay. Senator Limmer. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Committee members, are there other questions? Okay. Um, we do have the A3 amendment before us. Um, Senator Seeberger, would you like to move the A3 amendment? So moved. Any discussion? Okay. Um, Senator Seeberger has moved the A3 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The A3 amendment is adopted. Um, back to the underlying bill. Um, Senator Seeberger, uh, will you move that uh, Senate file 302 as amended be recommended to pass and move to the floor? So moved. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> okay. Um, the motion is adopted. We're now going to skip to uh, uh, Senate file 1474 on the agenda. So, Senator Westland, you're up. Senator Westland. Good afternoon. It's up here. <clears throat> it is my pleasure today to present to you the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership uh, Bill. Um, this is a bill that uh, does not raise new money, but in essence will reallocate funds from the dissolution filing fee and also from the marriage license filing fee um, to help uh, establish some additional funding for the Minnesota Family Resilience, Resiliency Partnership. Um, for more than 40 years, um, MFRP easier, um, has uh, provided pre-employment services and family stabilization programming um, through six regional partners across the state. It's the only program in the state specifically designed to help displaced homemakers address unique barriers that they face while trying to enter or re-enter the workforce as they navigate a very personal loss due to death, disability, or divorce from a spouse or partner. According to the most recent data available, 60% of displaced homemakers served by the program were victims of domestic violence. Of the participants with a child support order, 75% we're not receiving the support as ordered by the court. This program serves a population that faces multiple barriers to self-sufficiency. 97% of the program participants identify as female. What makes this program more than a workforce development program is its holistic and client-driven approach. Participants are served through a combination of activities including one-to-one -one self-sufficiency counseling, weekly workshop series that focus on life skills, needs assessments, and the creation of individualized action plans. The program also helps participants identify and access resources that will make it possible for them to begin their journey towards self-sufficiency. The services result in excellent outcomes. 97% of participants successfully complete the program by attaining the goals they've set at intake which include completing the steps to, in their individualized self-sufficiency plan, pursuing a degree or certificate program, and or becoming employed. 
And I would just share as, um, as someone who in my, my own life has been on a journey where I have, uh, for most of my adult life, been a single parent. Um, I returned to school as a non-traditional student with an, and uh, started law school with an eight-year-old child. Um, I can speak, I think, from personal experience to the challenges faced um, by particularly women who are experiencing extreme displacements in their lives. And when we have a programming such as this that has such a high success rate that actually helps people move to be self-sufficient after severe life disruptions, uh, I can tell you that this helps us bring people into um, becoming their best selves, if you will, and part of that being a, a member of our community and our society that are able to contribute not only to the well-being of their kids, but to the community in general. Um, and I would like to also say that this bill does have uh, bipartisan support. Senator Housley has carried this bill in the past. Um, she is a co-author, and Senator Limmer has also recently been added as a co-author, and I know Senator Limmer has been a big supporter of this bill in the past as well. And so I am now going to turn it over to um, Ms. Keenan to provide some additional, more detailed information about this program. It is a worthy program and uh, hope that you will all support it. Thank you, Senator Westland. And Ms. Keenan, if you could state your full name and title for the record when you begin. Jean Keenan, I'm the executive director of one of the programs in the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. So very simply stated, the goal of our program is to help participants achieve lasting self-sufficiency by interrupting the downward spiral um, often faced after the loss of a family's primary wage earner. In your, in your packets, you'll find a great deal of information about the program along with the written testimony of a past program participant. We recognize how busy you are and wanted to be respectful of your time today. We appreciate your work and the strong current and past legislative support our program has received. This wraparound program is offered at no cost to participants, all of whom are at or below 200% of the federal poverty guideline. We're very proud to say that our program is both inclusive and individualized. Many participants are leaving unsafe relationships. 22% enter the program unhoused. Nearly a third of our participants identify as a race or ethnicity other than white. Each individual will work with a provider to develop a unique action plan, essential transferable skills or soft skills, and effective job search strategies. Most importantly, the program helps families to stabilize after the crisis by building a trusting relationship using trauma-informed care. Participants are eligible for services for 12 months and in some cases more. Funding for the program is authorized by statute and administered through deed from a portion of the fees collected from marriage license and divorce filings. This structure was specifically designed for this program alone. The amount collected from these fees was the, sole, the program's sole funding source from 1982 to 1992. There was a brief period during which the program was also funded through workforce development or general fund dollars. However, in 2003, it was recommended that we return to the use of these fees as our sole funding source, and that continues to the present. The amount allocated to the program has not been increased at any time in our program's nearly 40-year history. When Deed sends out a request for proposals, Three to five thousand dollars is considered an acceptable annual co cost per participant, and according to their formula, the cost per participant for our program is fourteen hundred and ninety-eight dollars. It is projected that the requested update to the statute would bring our program in line with the lowest end of that range. The services we provide are critical because those who participate in this program are often Minnesota's unseen, unemployed, or underemployed who may not otherwise receive services. We ask for your support for Senate File 1474. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keenan. Members, do you have questions or comments? OK, any final words, Senator Wesselin? I would just say that you know it's um, rare that we find um, programs that have such a high success rate that are highly targeted to people in need. And again, from my personal experience, I did not have access to a program like this um, uh, and uh, the challenges faced are real, um, and we want to make sure that we have the opportunity to support programs that are 
incredibly successful and again intervene um, especially with women who are experiencing such enormous um, changes in their lives to help them become self-sufficient. I think the statistics show that um, particularly for those who are leaving a relationship, either a divorce or, or um, uh, unmarried parents, that um, statistically women and children, uh, their standard of living decreases substantially. And so we want to make sure that we are helping people, um, again, be their best selves, be able to support their kids. And this is a great program. Can't say, can't say enough about it. Thank you. And thank you for sharing a little bit more about your personal story as well, Senator Wesslin. Um, this bill is being laid over. So with that, Senate File 1474 is laid over. Yep. Uh, Senator Mann, we're going to invite you back to uh, present Senate File 405. Thanks for staying with us, and whenever you're ready, we begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have an amendment. I don't know if this is the time to talk about that. Um, Senator Mann, let's have you start with an overview of the bill, and then we'll move to the testifiers, and then I'll give you an opportunity to go through the amendment. Perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, Senate File 405 will prohibit non-compete clauses in contracts. A non-compete clause is a contract between workers and firms that prohibits the employee's ability to work for competing firms. Employers can use these clauses for several reasons. However, the benefits incurred by the employers are most always come at a cost to the worker and to the economy as a whole. A non-compete clause will prohibit a worker from working within a certain geographical area uh, for, or um, for a certain amount of time after their current employment is terminated. For example, an employee working at a hair salon in Apple Valley will be prohibited from working at any competing hair salon within a 20 mile radius for a year. An employer working at McDonald's cannot work in any other McDonald's or any other fast food establishment within a 25 mile radius for 18 months. Or a physician cannot work for any other healthcare system within a 30 mile radius for two years. Effects of non-compete agreements include decrease in workers' bargaining power, which lead to lower wages. Non-competes prevent workers from finding new employment even after being fired without cause. Non-competes stifle the free market, fracture health care and patient care, hamper innovation, push people out of their communities, and non-competes sometimes induce workers to leave their occupations entirely, foregoing accumulated training and experience in their fields. Non-competes can be so destructive that the Federal Trade Commission has proposed banning non-competes at a federal level. They estimate that by banning non-competes, workers' wages across the country would increase by $300 billion per year and expand career opportunities for about 30 million Americans. The ability to change your job is the core to a competitive and thriving economy. With that, Madam Chair, we can move to testifiers. Thank you, Senator Mann. Um, up first, we have Jonathan Moeller with us uh, virtually. If you can unmute, uh, please state your name and title for the record when you begin. Chair and committee members, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Moeller. Uh, I'm Assistant Attorney General in the Consumer Wage and Antitrust Division of the Minnesota Attorney General's Office, and I work in the Wage Stock Unit. It's my job to ensure that Minnesota workers are paid the wages that they're owed. Attorney General Ellison regrets that he can't be with you today, but asked me to testify in his stead in order to voice his strong support for Senate File 405 which takes important steps to combat the use of non-compete agreements in Minnesota. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today, uh, and thank you for accepting my testimony. Um, non-compete clauses do a lot of harm and very little good. They pre prevent employees from leaving one job for a better one. They prevent employees from leaving a business and starting their own. Through non-compete clauses, employers have bound a wide range of workers from baristas to journalists to auto mechanics to sandwich makers and deprived them of the freedom to work where they choose. Research suggests that one in five American workers currently work under non-compete clauses. 
The Attorney General previously led a group of 19 Attorney Generals from around the country urging the FTC to make rules to outlaw non-compete clauses for low-wage workers. The FTC has responded to that call and is now in the process of rulemaking that would limit non-compete agreements generally, but would still allow states to provide additional regulation. Non-compete clauses in employment agreements suppress wages, they limit personal freedom, they stifle innovation, and they disincentivize employers from making their place work, uh, worker friendly. When employers arbitrarily and unnecessarily limit their workers' ability to get a new job, maybe one with better pay, um, better benefits, better working conditions, uh, they lock workers into a work situation without giving the worker something of value. Non-compete clauses also make it more difficult for other employers to hire workers, even when they're willing to pay better wages or offer better benefits. And they expose employers who want to hire those workers and are willing to pay the worker more to legal action by a current employer if they do hire the worker. In other words, they stifle innovation in favor of the status quo. Um, and they also hurt other businesses that would benefit from hiring away talented workers whose current em employers aren't able to promote them or aren't doing enough to retain them. Uh, a dominant firm in a marketplace can use non-competes to lock up a talent pool and starve up and coming competitors of high quality employees. It's clear from the prevalence of non-compete clauses that employers aren't just using them to protect confidential information in their investment in workers. They're requiring non-compete clauses to make it impossible for workers to leave so they don't have to compete to retain their workers. These clauses are anti-competitive, anti-innovation, anti-worker, and anti-free market. What's worse, um, these clauses are blunt instruments which are almost entirely unnecessary. Employers can protect their investments in workers by incentivizing them to stay, not punishing them if they leave. Among other things, employers can offer term contracts with job security for both the worker and the employer. They can offer raises, they can offer promotions, they can offer better working conditions. They also have other legal recourse and legal protections that already protect their interests. In particular, Trade secret laws and intellectual property rights are tools that employers can use that are more tailored, less blunt, and have less impact on a worker's freedom of movement and freedom to work. Employers shouldn't be able to limit workers' freedoms to find the best job for themselves and limit other employers and entrepreneurs from hiring qualified workers away from competitors. Senate File 405 is good common sense law to make sure abusive non-compete clauses are not used in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahler. Uh, next up, uh, Brian Rochelle. Did I pronounce that right? You did pronounce that right, Charles. All right. All, all these, uh, these French names that come before us, uh, don't know which way to go with them. So. And then they lose their Frenchness over time. It turns, they tend to, it yes. Sounds. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Lats, uh, committee members, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and testify today. My name is Brian Rochelle. Um, I'm the president of the Minnesota chapter of NELA, which is the National Employment Lawyers Association, or an organization of attorneys who represent employees and workers around the country. I'm here to testify in support of Senate uh, File 405, which would restrict uh, anybody from entering into a non-competition agreement. And my remarks are gonna be at the beginning here a little bit uh, repetitive from the testimony that you just heard, but I do think when we're talking about non-competition or non-compete agreements, it really is important to situate it into the broader context of the types of restrictive covenants or agreements that limit employees in the employment context. You have trade secret limitations. Um, those are the things that say you can't steal uh, your company's proprietary secrets. And you have non-solicitation agreements. Non-solicitation agreements limit your ability to take, for instance, uh, or encourage uh, employees to leave the employer. And then you have, as a separate function, non-compete agreements. And when you strip them out from the context of the other two, you see that the only purpose of a non-compete agreement is to limit an employee's mobility in the marketplace. It's to limit their ability to find another job. So at its core, what a non-compete agreement says is that when you leave your employment, whether that's you're fired or you quit or you wanna try to find a better job for you and your family, you have to be unemployed for 12, 
24 months, not earn a living. That's just not sound policy, and there's no good reason that we should allow that to be enforced. Um, as the previous testimony and as uh, Attorney General Ellison's letter submitted to this group highlights, it's anti-competitive. It doesn't allow for free movement in the marketplace. It's anti-worker, it's anti-innovation, and it also deprives companies of the ability to attract and hire talent to grow. It's an artificial barrier that the state of Minnesota shouldn't allow. I wanna talk briefly about a few specific examples, and I wanna start by highlighting that as an attorney who represents employees, I get paid to advise employees on non-compete agreements. I get paid to litigate non-compete agreement disputes. A lot of our members do as well, and we're here saying we shouldn't. Employees shouldn't have to waste that money in order to be free to just move around the marketplace uh, the way that they would be if they weren't stuck in a non-compete agreement. Uh, now, non-competes are particularly egregious for people who have maybe a more moderate or lower income and have almost no bargaining power when they're initially starting out to work. Um, a former client of mine, Emily Olson, is going to testify today, and you're going to hear her story about being subject to a non-compete um, as a hairstylist. And you've heard news coverage about fast food workers who have been subject to non-competes. This is common. I have talked to people who are subject to non-competes that serve no legitimate business purpose. I have a client right now um, who is a dispatcher for a parcel delivery company. He has a one-year non-compete agreement that's so broad it says he can't work in any similar field doing any similar work. This is somebody who's dispatching trucks to deliver packages. He loses his job. He has nowhere to go. He has nothing to do. He got a bona fide job offer from another employer saying, you can be a dispatcher for us, but he was legally obligated to show him his non-compete agreement. He did. They wouldn't hire him. They said, no, we could get sued for this. So he cannot find employment and is working independently uh, as a driver making significantly less money for no good reason. One of the other ways that non-competes harm uh, employees and workers that we haven't heard about yet here today is they can be used as a punitive sword. So the bulk of the work that I do is representing workers who are bringing employment disputes against their former employers, whether that be discrimination, harassment, retaliation. And virtually every employee in Minnesota has some form of a non-competition agreement these days. So one of the things that we see, if we say that we're gonna represent a worker uh, in a dispute, maybe they weren't paid a fair wage, maybe they were fired for blowing the whistle, is the employer comes back and threatens a counterclaim. Says, we're gonna sue you for breach of a non-compete agreement if you go find another job. And it puts the employee in a position where they have to make an impossible choice of being threatened with a lawsuit to keep them unemployed for 12, uh, 12 or 24 months or to pursue their valid legitimate legal rights. And that's not something that Minnesota should support. Um, I wanna also briefly note, because I think it's important for this committee, um, concerns that non-compete agreements might somehow disrupt or be harmful to the economy or the market are just simply unfounded. I think it's important to highlight that the state of California does not allow for non-compete agreements, hasn't allowed for non-compete agreements for decades. And I think we can all agree that the state of California has a pretty robust and innovative economy. So I think I'll leave the committee with that. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. Um, we're gonna continue through the testimony and if people who testify are able to stick around in case there are questions from committee members afterward, that'd be great. Thank you. We'll ask uh, Kevin Borowski to come forward, please. <clears throat> and then uh, Emily Olson, if you want to come here and take the other chair that is available, and you'll be ready to testify after Mr. Borowski. Sir, go ahead, state your full name for the record, your affiliation, and proceed with your testimony. Kevin Borowski, and I'm with Local 26 SEIU. Chair and members of the committee, for most of the last decade, I have been a caretaker in a condo in Minneapolis working for First Service Residential. My wife, who also does this work, and I live in the building and do work to make sure everything is running okay and clean and comfortable for the residents. You may have seen my story in the news over the last month as following my public push to form a union because of that, I was fired, and now my wife lost her job too. We were forced to leave our home since our home is tied to our job. 
We are fighting that decision, but I am here today to talk about the salt in the wound that came with this already frustrating and scary event. Caretakers and desk attendants at my company have been forced to sign these non-compete agreements as part of our employment, which means we wouldn't be able to do similar work for a substantial period of time after leaving the company. The fact that so many workers sign these agreements would be laughable if it wasn't so common. It forces workers to stay at companies instead of taking better offers and holds down people's chance to make a living. It means if you are like myself and my wife and we have done something for a decade and you leave your company for whatever reason, you can't do the work you are most skilled at. It's another way of corporations are rigging the system to make sure workers can't. I'm happy to say that after my story was in multiple media outlets, my company reached out to let me know they were revoking the non-compete from all their Minnesota employees. We are now free from this clause going forward, but it shouldn't take a situation like mine to address this situation. Since then, I have spoken on a Federal Trade Commission panel about the same issue. There are big businesses who are very dedicated to stopping any action. And now that I have been out of my work, I see why. Competing companies have told me they would not approach workers from first service residential with job opportunities because they were aware of the non-compete agreements we had. I can now see how much potential earnings I missed out from this. In fact, this morning I looked on Indeed.com. My previous job is listed, and they're offering much more money per hour than I got after working there for 10 years. That's measurable, and that's real. I am thankful you are taking on this issue here in Minnesota and excited to see action at the national level. <coughs> Please pass this bill and make Minnesota a leader in standing up to working families. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. And as you are uh, leaving the testifier table, if uh, Zeke McKinney, uh, Dr. McKinney, oh, that's virtual, okay. Um, and we'll just uh, leave the chair empty for now. Ms. Olson, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank State you. your name and your affiliation. Yes. My name is Emily Olson. Thank you, Chair Letts and members for allowing me to be here today and speak on behalf of my industry. I am, as they said, a, a hairstyle, hairstylist, and um, I'm here basically to, well, first of all, I have all these cut and paste notes, so just follow <laughs> along here. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm here today to defend the right to pursue happiness. It's a simple notion. And it was the right, the right to pursue happiness is bestowed upon all of us by our constitutional guarantee. It's incumbent upon us as citizens to bestow that right upon each other. I wanna tell you how the right to pursue my happiness was taken away from me and thousands of other people in the salon and spa industry because of a non-compete. The freedom to make career choices for myself and my family was taken away from me. I became a hairstylist at 20 years old. My goal was to become a leader. I found a salon and I moved up the ladder quickly. And at 29, I became an executive regional director to four different salons. Two years later, I became pregnant and I learned rather quickly that being a mother and an executive of a big salon spa uh, cannot coincide together. And um, I had a decision to make and like other, any mother would do, I chose my daughter. And I decided to leave the company to, to different changes that were happening. And um, I was ready to make a new move in my career. I had gotten up as high as I could in that business and it was time to find the next move. Um, I, although, here's where my happiness was taken away from me. I had a non-compete that stated that I couldn't work for two years within 25 miles of all four locations. I worked at one where I did hair. If you took two of the furthest ones apart from each other and added 25 miles to that, that was at least 75 miles for me to have to travel. That is insane. I, um, not only that, I couldn't do any of the same or similar, similar services on any client that I had serviced within the last year of my employment. Get this. Um, 
It included clients that I had brought to the salon, and it included my mother. I couldn't do my mom's hair, because she I had done her hair within the last year of being employed at that salon. Um, hang on, page two. <laughs> um, it's, it's really hard at that point. My relationship with my daughter's dad fell apart because of the stress of me leaving that salon, having to follow this non-compete, and facing, you know, what am I going to do? I can't work anywhere in the Twin Cities or even the surrounding area doing what I was trained in. And my relationship fell apart. I needed to use my 401k in order to survive. Um, I ended up short sailing my house just to provide a, try to provide a roof over my head. I had no money to hire an attorney I worked with Brian, he was, he's been great. Um, most of the time it was, you know, you get your free hour with your attorney and then you find out, you've signed this paper, there's not much we can do. Um, I couldn't bring my clientele with me anywhere I went. They were considered property of the salon, um, which is hard for them to realize too. I had to start all over, ground zero, paying bills that I had made on a, on a high salary to peanuts. Um, you know, even if I had a little money to consult an attorney, it, my non-compete states that I have to pay also for my former employees or lawyer fees. There's no such thing as a lateral move in my industry. As long as there is a period of time and a geographical area restriction in the non-compete. Hang on, page three. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, it's one of the best things as a parent is when your child looks up at you with a big smile and says they want to be just like you. And hearing my daughter say she wanted to be a hairstylist too, I, I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to have so much fun. And then I start to tear up because I want to tell her to choose a different career. Because the dreams that I was chasing caused so much immense pain in my life, in my family. Does this even seem logical or fair to you? Putting a restriction on distance and time frame together is monopolizing somebody's career and their ability to pursue happiness. It's our constitutional right, and the reason I'm here today is to defend that right to pursue happiness. So please take in consideration the thousands of people standing behind me, rooting me on and hoping that we can be the change today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Olson. And, and, uh... For the record, uh, I've had a couple of clients who are in exactly the position, same kind of job that you're in, and it's, it's unconscionable. Yes, thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, we're going to go on to uh, Dr. Uh, Zeke McKinney, who is online with us. Dr. McKinney, go ahead and state your name and your affiliation and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Dr. Zeke McKinney, and I'm an occupational medicine doctor in Minnesota, and I'm president of Advocates for Better Health, which was formerly known as Twin Cities Medical Society. I'm here in support of Senate File 405 because non-compete clauses are a major healthcare issue, and I'll walk you through why. With the growing complexities of health, the health insurance market and increasing administrative overhead, it's becoming more and more rare for physicians to work in an independent practice, especially in primary care fields. Instead, Doctors are now uh, commonly employees of large healthcare organizations, and with increasingly frequent acquisitions and mergers of these organizations, uh, which are somewhat controversial, we end up seeing more doctors now working for fewer employers statewide. Nationally, doctors are about three times as likely as other American workers to have non-competes in their contracts. Uh, in 2018, that figure was estimated to be 45% of all physicians. While we don't have these specific numbers here in Minnesota, uh, we assume with the growing industry consolidation that that number is going up. So what does this mean for the healthcare of Minnesotans? Well, if a doctor who's bound by a non-compete clause wants to suddenly separate from their employer, they're trapped. If they leave, they either have to work a significant distance away from their current practice, potentially uprooting their family, or they have to take one or more years away from practicing medicine in their specialty. And by the way, this time away makes it really hard to get another job after that lapse. This ends up causing harm to patients in a few different ways. Uh, first, it makes much, it much less appealing for doctors to come to Minnesota or stay in Minnesota for jobs because many other states have already banned the use of non-competes, either universally or specifically for healthcare. We have growing physician shortages in Minnesota, particularly in rural areas, where recent data shows that one in three rural Minnesota doctors plans to stop practicing medicine in the next five years. 
we need to make it more appealing for physicians to come work here and non-complete clauses actually do the opposite of that. Secondly, these clauses actively push physicians out of their local areas. So for example, a colleague of mine was working as a psychiatrist in a rural Minnesota city with a high need and few options for this type of specialty care. She decided to leave her employer due to professional concerns, but then her non-compete clause prevented her from legally caring for the same patients in her own area, leaving them without access to this specialty, even though she still lives in that area. The same thing happens to physicians working in the Twin Cities who are forced to find a new job outside of the metro area, again, leaving their patients behind. And this becomes even a bigger problem when there's such a rare specialty that maybe there's only a very few physicians that do that. For example, I have a clinic seeing complex environmental exposures to dust and chemicals and mold, and people see me from outside of the state and everywhere. And what would happen if I suddenly couldn't practice anymore? So this leads to the third and most important reason that not competes harm health, namely by disrupting patient care. When a healthcare company uses a non-compete clause, it takes away our ability uh, as patients to continue receiving care from the doctor that we choose, the doctor knows us best, the doctor we trust. This artificial disruption in the doctor-patient relationship ultimately causes real harm. So I'm asking you to please vote to eliminate the use of non-complete clauses in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, now, if Gavin Hansen could come forward. And uh, Charles Goldstein, both of you come on up and take one of the testifier at the table, uh, chairs at the table. And we will hear from Mr. Hansen first. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Gavin Hansen, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Business Partnership, which represents many of Minnesota's largest employers. The Minnesota Business Partnership opposes Senate File 405, a prohib uh, prohibition on non-compete agreements in its current form. We agree with adding protections for employees, much of, uh, you know, you're here already today. Um, uh, excuse me. We agree with adding protections for employees in industries where non-compete may be enforceable. Using a wage threshold is one option uh, for this sort of a scenario. However, an outright prohibition on all non-competes across every industry is something we strongly oppose and would greatly impact our members. Minnesota is home to a diverse economy with many innovative businesses across a range of sectors. From manufacturing of optic and medical devices to machinery and electrical equipment, ATV vehicles and aircraft, this diversity is what makes Minnesota's economy unique among its peers. Ensuring ideas that make our businesses unique remain secure is vital. Non-compete agreements are one of the tools employers use to secure information and prevent it from traveling from business to business. Non-compete agreements protect a company's intellectual property, confidential and trade secret information, investments in developing good, uh, customer goodwill, and other legitimate business and proprietary interests. Employers and employees have invested time, resources, and brain power into developing information that is intrinsic to their livelihood. To remain a hub of in innovation, we must protect work environments that foster the free flow of ideas and the ability to share important proprietary information securely amongst employees. Prohibiting non-competes will disrupt that workplace culture, hindering the free flow of ideas and stifling innovation in the process. Overburdensome mandates will not only jeopardize employees' hard-earned livelihood, but threaten the ingenuity that helps Minnesota's businesses thrive. As such, the Minnesota Business Partnership does not support new mandates on non-compete agreements. I appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns with the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Mr. Goldstein, mm -hmm. state Thank your you very much. name and Mr. Your affiliation. Go ahead. Members, I am Charles Goldstein, plaintiff's employment law attorney. My office is advocate at work. This is purely an issue of great import. Some argue that invalidation of non-compete agreements by government fiat is an undue interference by the government into corporate contracts, as we've heard from him. On the other hand, there are innumerable areas in which the government appropriately places conditions on contracts in favor of promoting the welfare of employees and supporting the economy. There are numerous rationale to support the position that non-compete agreements are harmful to employees and employers of all types and sizes. These are the top reasons, and I'm providing articles to you by email which are the result of research by experts on the LexisNexis platform, that this legislation is not only advisable, but long overdue. One, it is necessary for employees to have maximum mobility for healthy competition, as we've heard today. Take, for example, the metropolitan doctor, whose non-compete restricts him or her from moving to a clinic in a rural area, simply because that location could be within a specified number of miles of one of the locations of a metropolitan clinic. Highly skilled technical professionals, such as inventors, who live in states where employee non-competes are enforceable, have incentives to relocate to states 
where such agreements are not enforced and their career flexibility is hence less constrained and talented people leave the state of Minnesota. Within the U.S., employment lawyers are routinely counsel clients subject to non-competes to take jobs in states that do not sanction non-competes. Even if skilled talent exists in a region, startups still face challenges in attracting key workers due to their uncertain life chances and limited resources. Unless they are content to recruit talent from universities or from the ranks of the unemployed, startups must attract workers from existing firms. Thus, entrepreneurial regions rely heavily on fluid interorganizational mobility of workers. Number two, employees' wages have long been failing to meet the ever-rising cost of living, especially now, as we've seen. Without the ability to seek alternative employment with a competitive wage, those subject to non-compete agreements, especially those which are unreasonably strict, essentially become wage slaves at all levels. Number three, while those touting the advisability of blue-lining these agreements by the courts believe that process is the remedy for overbearing and unreasonable provisions, keep in mind that those cases consume valuable time of the courts and cost of litigants, cost litigants a lot of money. I've been there, cases sometimes take two or three days for the court to wade through when they could be handling domestic abuse matters, criminal matters, and other cases of more import to society. Number four, what about employees who are entering these agreements voluntarily and willingly as part of the negotiating process toward employment? The answer is that employees have no concept of what sort of restrictions are actually reasonable when they enter them. And in many cases, employers are getting away with unreasonable geographical and time limitations. Number five, well, what about situations in which employers are abusing employees due to non-compete restrictions, precluding the employees from seeking alternative work to earn a necessary standard of living? In other words, the employer basically has the employee entrapped. They're in a situation where they could be abused, harassed, yet because of a non-compete clause and their, the necessity that they find employment, they're unable to leave that employer. Number six, a critical negative effect on Minnesota employers, our economy and society in general, is that due to restrictions on employee mobility, those employers in our society are deprived of capable workers filling critical needs in our economy. I beseech you to consider and support this legislation for all the reasons I have given and those stated in the articles I can provide to you and will provide to you today following this hearing and on my website at advocateatwork.com. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, that's all we have on our pre-signed uh, up testifier list. Is there anyone else in the room that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? Sure. Sir, come on forward. Go ahead and have a seat and identify yourself and your affiliation, please, and tell us what you'd have to say. Uh, Kurt Erickson. I'm a lawyer in uh, Minneapolis. Um, working at Littler Mendelssohn. I came to testify in opposition to 405. Um, I did see, however, that there's a author's amendment that's gonna be offered, um, which kind of changes a little bit of what I was going to say, depending on whether the author's amendment is accepted or not, and I'm assuming it will be. We will be considering it, so go ahead and tailor your testimony accordingly. I'll do my best. Um, you. You're a lawyer, I'm sure you can, you're an agile mind, right? <laughs> well, as agile as possible at age 63, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, some, some are. Since I, he's Senator Limmer, I tell you, we got something going here today. <laughs> Mr. Um, Erickson, go ahead. This bill is really going to hurt with regard to small and medium-sized businesses. That's where it's really going to come to roost. Um, in the Senate Commerce Committee where there was testimony taken, I know one of the senators talked about a chiropractic business that he had and my understanding was that was a business from uh, outstate Minnesota. So the idea that a business, a smaller or medium-sized business could invest substantial sums in getting, let's say, a, a fellow chiropractor going and then have that person turn around and open a shop uh, a block or two away uh, after a short period of time would frustrate the investment. And those types of investments are really big money for small and medium-sized businesses. So that's a point that I'd really like you to consider, which is that the investments that small and medium-sized businesses make in getting somebody started in a particular business or profession 
as something that we have to protect. It, it, it means a lot less, right, if you're working at General Motors or, or, or some, somewhere like that, but for small and medium-sized businesses, it's a big thing. The other thing I think to start out with, uh, which is important, is the whole idea that this bill, I, I heard uh, Assistant Attorney General Moeller's testimony about how anti-competitive these things are. My understanding was that uh, Attorney General Ellison, not this session, but last session, proposed a bill with a salary threshold. This bill's companion, House File 295, started with a salary threshold. Um, recently, that bill before the House and a committee, I can't remember which committee it was, was adopted again with a salary threshold and with a fleshing out with regard to exempting non-solicitation um, non agreements, exempting confidentiality and trade secret requirements. Some of the things that are talked about in this particular amendment that uh, Senator Mann is, I understand, going to offer today. So... What we're really talking about then in terms of a difference, as I understand it, is a difference in this bill, assuming that the amendments come through, of saying that all non-competes are out, period, versus what's currently in the House bill. Uh, and again, it hasn't been passed by the House, but it's gone through a committee in which it has a salary threshold of, uh, I think, median income for a family of four and above which approximately can vary, I think, but it's either between seventy-five dollars and $90,000 per year, somewhere like that. I think that salary threshold directly addresses many of the things that were testified to here today, while at the same time ensuring that we have people who are high wage earners uh, and who are having investments made in their employment um, subject to non-competes. So I think that is what I wanted to say with regard to that. If we're gonna, if we're gonna do that, I, I know this bill, Senate File 405, started out with a salary threshold, but that was by mistake, uh, according to Senator Mann and the Commerce Committee. But I don't believe it was a mistake in House File 295 that Representative Elkins started in the Senate or the House um, Commerce or Labor Committee and where it progressed to the next committee. So I would ask you um, to consider um, the salary threshold if you are going to pass the bill. I would say further that in support of uh, Gavin Hansen's comments, I think his comments about investment, uh, comments about free flow within the, the, the businesses, all those things are particularly germane with regard to small and medium sized businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Erickson, could you could you wait there one second? Yes. I just want to see if there's anyone else who wants to testify that's in the room. Um, I don't see anyone. I know we're going to consider Senator Mann's amendment in a moment, but I do want to ask you a couple of questions since you're at the table and won't have to have you come back <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, I, I will confess that I've kind of approached this from a, uh, a kind of a torn position on this. I mean, I represent mostly employees in, in my personal, in my private practice, and some of them faced non-competes, some non-solicitation clauses, and so on. And so on. I'm, I'm grateful to see the clarity in the upcoming amendment that separates out some of the trade secret and non-solicitation provisions and so on, just from the non-competes, which in some cases have been used as a proxy to protect the other things. Um, um, and I have had clients literally in, in the hairdresser, you know, field um, that have just have had a terrible time dealing with the situation. But I wonder if Ms. Olson would, how it would, how she would fall, if at all, within a salary threshold kind of situation. Um, sounds like, for, like, one of her comments anyway was that she was making really good money for a while there. Right. Um, and so what if she ends up above the salary threshold, however you define it, um, but then makes a decision to stay at home with her child or the, the current work environment isn't going to work as well for having the child, but she wants to work in a different 
salon for maybe less money, but still keep income coming in. How do you address that kind of a situation? Oh, let me answer How that two, two ways. One is what I understand, which is in House File 295, as presently amended, talks about what your salary is going to be or is expected to be with regard to that. So the expected to be part might be something that um, a, a hairstylist would be looking at with regard to that. Uh, the second part with regard to, um, the second part of that answer really is, um, to me, and, and I know that the blue pencil doctrine was disparaged here, but the blue pencil doctrine really stands for ensuring that uh, we don't have an overly harsh or overly excessive restriction or penalty for signing a non-compete. And if I heard the testimony correctly, and I think I did, I think Ms. Olson ta talked about having a two-year non-compete uh, as a hairstylist. I too, uh, Senator Latz, uh, have represented employees, not just employers, not just employees that have left for a new company or excuse me, stayed with a company, but also employees who have been challenging non-competes. And the argument that I would be making in that situation is that that um, two-year restriction ought to be limited down to one year or less, depending on, for example, the amount of time that the person spent at the business, the amount of clients that the person had at the business, the amount of clients that the person brought to the business, um, the amount of trade secret or customer proprietary information that they had, which in a hairstylist business probably is uh, a list of customers, things like that. Uh, those would all be things that uh, I think virtually every judge that I've dealt with on these matters would be considering for purposes of making a decision. And maybe even more importantly, those would be things that the, that the employer um, excuse me, the uh, the new employer would be looking at for purposes of saying, is this non-compete really going to be enforceable or not? So I, I think even before you get to litigation, I think if you, if you basically draft the arguments with regard to what will be in litigation, and this has been my personal experience as well, most employers or prospective employers will look at those arguments and make a determination as to whether they want to hire somebody or not. In the cases that I've dealt with, I've had employers say, yeah, I don't think that those, that those non-compete restrictions are going to be enforceable given everything that you've told me about it. I would find it, for example, incredible that somebody goes to work for a company for six months and assuming that they don't have real access to customer proprietary information or trade secret information, they turn around and say, well, now we're going to enforce a two-year non-compete against you. I would like to be representing the employee in that situation if we're going to go to, go to court. So, I mean, I, I think there are, I've been listening very carefully to all the testimony here because I really am troubled by I, I understand the arguments on both sides. I think I'm sympathetic to the arguments uh, being made by employers as well as employees. And I think, Mr. Erickson, there, there are different classes of or categories of employees. There are those who are better informed, better resourced, one might argue more sophisticated with regard to the rules surrounding their employment or potential employment. And they might think about these things ahead of time before they decide to go to a to accept a job with a particular employer and they and when they exit they'll be they'll have the resources to to challenge it if they choose to do so um, but then there are those employees that don't give it a second thought um, you know they're excited to go to work for a particular company they're excited about the opportunities um, at whatever level or kind of job it is um, they don't read the employment agreement that they're asked to sign Right. Um, if they did, it was five years ago, and they don't remember it was even in there when they decided to go looking for another job or they received an unsolicited invitation to go somewhere else. Um, they may not even think about, may not have the paperwork anymore, may not disclose it to the, the new employer. Um, and then they're in a position where whatever the circumstances of their departure, whether it was amicable or not, maybe especially if it was not, they're going to have a former employer that's going to, for whatever reason, maybe 
just uh, vengefulness decide they're going to try to enforce a non-compete. And whether in the end it could be upheld in a court is really not the question. It's, it's whether or not there's a capacity to go through the litigation and to defend that position in the first place. Well, and, and to that point, and I'm not an apologist for the salary threshold, but let's assume that you're a 22-year-old, you're just out of school, and you want that first job, and it's like, oh my God, I've got a, I've got a job, I'm signing on the dotted line, I, I can figure out these papers later, I'm so thrilled to have a job. Um, in that situation, the salary threshold at least addresses that to some extent, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about somebody who's maybe starting at Forty or fifty or sixty thousand dollars annually, and then wants to move afterwards, but doesn't meet the salary threshold, and in that situation, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be um, affected by by the non compete. Do you have any other suggestions other than a salary threshold that might meet the the goals of of your testimony, but not unreasonably restrict? an employee's ability to, to leave and to move on to another job? I, I think the big thing that's most important is tailoring non-competes to protect trade secrets and confidential information. So that even if you're a 22-year-old, and uh, but you're going to be, you're a whiz kid, so to speak, and you're going to be given all kinds of trade secret information, um, I, I think that everyone is entitled to have that information protected. And even in Senator Mann's proposed amendments and in the current version of House File 295, um, those types of uh, materials are protected. And uh, to Mr. Hansen's point, it's really a matter of using that information um, uh, with a competitor for purposes to the detriment of the uh, of the employer who gave that information to the person. And so, Mr. Erickson, I'm going to ask you the natural follow-up question of that, which yeah. is, can those interests be protected with separate uh, trade secret provisions, non-solicitation provisions, confidential proprietary information I, provisions, I think the independent uniform, from a non-compete? I think the Uniform Trade Secrets Act goes away toward protecting those interests. But I don't think it completely protects those interests because of the just of the nature of information. Once you have information like that, you have an ability to compete, not even using the trade secret information in violation of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. The non-compete provision protects from that for a period of time, not, not indefinitely, but for a period of time. So the answer is yes, it does protect, but not completely. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll move on and consider the amendment that uh, Senator Mann would like us to consider. Now, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Thank Mr. you, Senator. Committee. Um, I should probably ask you if there's anyone else on the committee has any questions um, at some point, but maybe let's consider the amendment first, and then we'll open it up for further conversation. Um, Senator Umu Verbaten, uh, would you like to offer the amendment and we'll have discussion about it? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A11 uh, amendment. All right, members, we have the A11 amendment before us. Has it been distributed or is it in the packets? Okay, it's in your packets, members. And I will call your attention also, members, um, there are other materials in the packets, letters in support of and in opposition to the bill. Um, Mr. Chair. Probably those letters were presented before the A11 amendment was drafted, so take that into consideration. Senator Mann, to, your, to the amendment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one very small oral amendment to the amendment, if I could do that. Yes, please. Uh, on line 1.25, remove the word buyer and replace it with the word seller. Ooh, that might make a difference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Umu Verbaden, do you incorporate that into your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Mann, would you please describe the amendment to us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the amendment um, clarifies, again, there's, there's a bit of a misunderstanding of what a non-compete is or is not. And so we have added language to clarify 
Uh, so for example, the trade secrets, all the proprietary information people have concerns about, uh, we made sure to clarify that those things are best uh, protected with non-disclosure agreements uh, and other agreements to, trade, uh, to protect trade secrets um, or um, client lists, contact lists, soliciting customers, et cetera. Those things do not have anything to do with a non-compete. Um, we added definitions, including independent contractor. And then lastly, we had one exception to a non-compete, and that is when someone sells their business. And we um, talked with um, senators from our last committee um, to come up with that language. So, Senator Mann, I do have a question uh, since the language in the uh, other bodies bill that is traveling there was brought up. I did get a copy of it and took a look at it, and there are a number of, it appears, other carve-outs um, that are in that language as well, including a salary threshold uh, provision, which I don't know if you're drawing how you draw a line that is meaningful. Uh, in the end on that question, but um, what are your thoughts on some of the other carve-outs or exceptions that are in the, the other language on the other body? Mr. Chair, uh, I do know that about the wage carve-out, um, and as we heard today, these affects all wage earners from fast food workers, hairstylists, counselors, doctors, CEOs of companies. Um, this affects everybody. And so to have a wage carve out, and one especially in that language in the House bill, is kind of wishy-washy. It's not a set amount. Um, and it fluctuates with the economy. That would be incredibly difficult to take care of on a daily basis. Um, and again, because it affects everybody across all wage limits, I remove that completely. I did have a bill uh, previously without a wage limit, and I mistakenly did drop the bill with the wage limit in it. And so I clean it up as soon as I found out. And Senator Mann, what about some of the other exceptions or carve-outs in the other body's language? I'm not sure what those are. Could you, could you point them out to me? Well, for example, uh, for example, there's a, uh, I'll just list for you. An agreement not to interfere with an employer's vendor, supplier, or other business relationships. Um, an invention assignment agreement. An agreement, uh, let's see, you've addressed the, uh, the buy and sell, buy and sell situation, uh, or selling the goodwill of a business. Um, agreements involving forfeiting incentives or equity if they elect to compete. Um, an advance notice provision. Uh, those are some of those are the other. They also include confidentiality or non-disclosures and trade secrets, or inventions, and, and uh, non-solicitation provisions um, and client list provisions, which you do include in your amendment. So, any thoughts on those other exceptions? Uh, I think we removed many of them just to make the bill cleaner because some of them, again, are not due to non-competes um, and can be best uh, addressed with other things such as non-disclosure agreements. Um, that's all I have. Any other members of the committee have any questions or concerns, uh, discussion you'd like to share? Mr. Chair. Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just um, really appreciated the testimony from Ms. Olson, and for me that demonstrates why the salary cap is, is problematic. Um, and why this is particularly a, an issue, a, a gender equity issue as well. It's a variety of reasons why I think it's harder for um, women to have to leave the workforce and then um, be able to find, you know, a job in, in their field that they've worked so hard to get into. And we already earn less. Um, but that's, that's another issue. Uh, 
Well, we have before us the A11 amendment, and if that's adopted, then uh, we'll have the, the bill itself to consider. Uh, any further discussion on the A11? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at the A11 amendment, and uh, I'm wondering why independent contractor is included um, as part of this, if you could comment on that. I'm sorry, Senator Kroon. I got caught consulting with staff. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just inquiring about uh, the inclusion of independent contractor into the A11 amendment and what the uh, reasoning behind that was. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair, so we added independent contractor because we did not want to incentivize any employer from changing the category of their employees to independent contractors so then they could apply a non-compete agreements. We wanted to capture everybody. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, but aren't there, there strict rules about you can't just recategorize somebody from an employee to an independent contractor. They actually have to fit the definition of an independent contractor under law and actually become an independent contractor. So um, I, I'm not sure that that's a reason to include an independent contractor. Is there, is, is there a substantive reason why an independent contractor who's actually an independent contractor under Minnesota law and doing ind conducting themselves as an independent contractor should be ensnared uh, into this definition and into this uh, bill. Senator Matt or Mr. Rochelle. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, I'd be happy to address that. The, the very same phenomena, the very same issues that have been testified about here today that impact employees apply equally with independent contractors. And so we see on an increasing basis in Minnesota and around the country, um, employers trying to classify workers as independent contractors. And the Senator's point is a good one. There is a legal test there. Um, so you have sort of the two buckets. One is where employers are improperly claiming that somebody's classified as an independent contractor when in fact they're not. So this is designed to sort of disincentivize that. But then to the Senator's question about, well, okay, but what about the real situation where you have a legally defined independent contractor um, it would incentivize a company to hire out maybe through uh, an independent agency um, to hire 1099 or independent contractor workers in order to continue to push the effects of the non-compete, which we've talked about here today, include depressing wages, decreasing the ability for workers, whether they're employees or independent contractors, to be mobile in the workforce, all of these same ultimate structural reasons that are just not sound policy. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, we're talking here about government placing restrictions on the right to contract. That's what we're talking about here. And yes, we, to the previous testifier's point, we do that on occasion. It's, there's a precedent for that, obviously. But in my view, the government should have a compelling reason to do that. Um, and you know, it, it's hard enough to see a compelling reason with kind of a blanket ban, but particularly with independent contractors, um, by definition, they, they're not, you know, they, they don't have to be tied to one specific employer. They, by definition of how they operate, they would have more um, of an ability to uh, choose who they work for, negotiate those terms, and that sort of thing. So it seems to me that the government really ought to have a compelling reason to step in and interfere in this way in those contracts between, um, you know, with an independent contractor. I don't really have a question, but feel free to respond. Mr. Rochelle. Chair Latson, members, that's a, that point is spot on. It, it squarely addresses why this is problematic. So I'll speak to a very specific example. Uh, two individuals who I represented not long ago were independent contractors. Everybody would agree they, they fit the legal definition. They worked um, as a 
two separate sole proprietorships and then essentially formed a partnership. And they were working with various furniture vendors. And there were, they were trying to develop a different business relationship. And then this non-compete agreement sort of came into the fold. They contacted me. I looked at it and I said, I don't understand why there would be a non-compete agreement when you're an independent contractor who, to, your, to the senator's point, is freely moving around the market uh, contracting with different entities. And so we looked into whether that would even be legally enforceable. But from just a pure policy matter, uh, I would submit that the government's interest in prohibiting a non-competition agreement would be more forceful in an independent contractor setting where legally the standard is supposed to be that the independent contractor can, to use the the parlance of uh, the where the law came from, serve any master, right? Um, so you can work with any other company or do any other kind of work that you want to do. In that context, a, a non-compete agreement is particularly egregious. Senator Crum. Thank you for the, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that response. Um, in your response, you, you talked about the, the situation with your client and you said you, you wondered whether or not it would even be enforceable, but then you didn't answer whether you think it would be enforceable. So I'm just going to ask you that question, whether under current law that would even be legally enforceable. Mr. Rochelle. Mr. Chair and members, I'm going to be characteristic and give you a direct uh, response and then talk probably more than you want me to. Um, I'm going to encourage I'll you not to because we only have a short period of time left in our committee today. Hence the preface. Our conclusion was that it was enforceable and we advised the, the clients accordingly. And the ultimate uh, conclusion was you can pay us a whole lot of money to try to challenge this, but it, it's probably going to be upheld and it's up to some random judge to make that determination and we don't know what they're going to say. I'm not seeing any other uh, committee members raising a hand to speak. Uh, sure. Senator Eichhorn. To the amendment or the underlying bill? We're on the amendment, Senator. Uh, to the underlying bill. Okay. Uh, so Senator Umu Verbaten uh, uh, moves that, Senator, that uh, the A11 amendment as amended. as amended be adopted. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Now to the bill. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my questioning, maybe while you're still at the chair for the current testifier, you might be the one to answer it uh, since you answered Senator Kroon's. Along the same line of questioning that Senator Kroon had um, to private contracts, I see some union folks in the room today. What about collective bargaining agreements? Would this kind of upend current collective bargaining agreements? Um, I don't think that's an area the state should get into if they've negotiated that. Maybe this is something they would like. I see they're not on the list to testify for this bill. They're here for another bill. But it's just kind of a curiosity. Is this going into that, or would they still be able to negotiate that as part of their agreement? And maybe this isn't something they normally have as part of a contract. I mean, maybe it's a non-issue, but it's a curiosity point. Uh, if you could touch on that either for the sponsor or for the testifier. Mr. Rochelle or Senator Mann. Chair and members, the only response that I have is it's a very accurate point that there are people in this room far better suited to answer that question than I am. That's not my area. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, I don't. I know so the folks aren't that are here aren't here for this bill specifically. If if they want to follow up with me later, I would be open to that. Or if you've got something you want to say now, it's just it's a point of curiosity, a point of concern because obviously. I don't want the state getting in the way of anybody's collective bargaining agreement. So if there is an area of concern that we need to address as this moves through the process, please let us know that as well. Thank you. Well, now we do have another testifier approaching. <laughs> Go ahead and identify yourself for it's the on. record. In your it's already on. All right, Bert Johnson, I'm general counsel for the Carpenters Regional Council. I will be uncharacteristically brief. Uh, we don't have concerns. Um, the collective bargaining agreement actually within the trades specifically allows free movement of carpenters from between employers. There are unions that have other um, clauses in their collective bargaining agreements, um, hiring halls and so forth, but that's protected by federal law. So this, this would not impact um, any contract that's negotiated and enforceable under the NLRA. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or, or discussion Senator Kroon, quickly, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll offer the A10. We're having the A10 distributed to members and the public. Members, we have uh, before us the A10 amendment. I just want to note for the record, it looks an awful lot like many of the provisions in the bill in the other body, but it was printed at 10.33 a.m. today before I even thought of the comments that I made and even saw the other body's language, just so the, the record is clear on that. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair, um, I don't see any issues with this language. I will say that the A11 amendment covered at least half of it. Um, so if we adopt it, it'll need to be amended so that we don't repeat the same language multiple times. Uh, so members, the uh, A10 amendment was drafted to amend the A11 amendment, uh, which makes me think that procedurally anyway, if we went ahead and if this A10 amendment were adopted, it could probably just be technically incorporated into the language of the bill. Is that possible, Council? Mr. Chair and members, you'll see that the A10 amendment amends the A11, and you'll see that it deletes lines 1.3 to 1.6 in the A11. It still includes those provisions substantively, but reorganizes it and includes the remaining provisions in the House language. So if this is adopted, um, it takes care of the technical issues. Uh, Senator Cruin, are there any provisions in the A10 amendment, or are there any provisions in the other bodies bill relating to exceptions that are not included in the A10 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can't say answer that definitively. I do not believe there are, um, but I have not actually looked at the other bodies language to confirm that, which I can do now. So, members, uh, councils inform me, it looks like all of the substantive provisions from the other bodies' language are included, but the language might be a little bit different, for example, with the purchase and sale um, and goodwill. So, um, we might want to consider which language is preferable. Um, and while that's being considered also, uh, maybe Senator Kroon, you can help me understand paragraph 6 in the A10 amendment. A10 amendment, there doesn't appear to be any restriction on advance notice. So theoretically, I suppose under this exception, an employer and an employee could, re could agree to require a one-year or two-year advance notice during which time period 
the employee would remain employed and receive compensation. Um, sounds like that might, in effect, be a non-compete by another name. So I'm a little concerned about that, now whether that's likely to, in fact, happen, I think, is, is you know, may or may not be the case. Um, but I'm wondering if there ought to be any kind of time limit there or any other restrictions placed in that language, or maybe I'm just misreading it and others can correct me. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I tried to draft, uh, my understanding of this draft was to align it as best as possible, but having said that, we certainly can um, you know, do what we want with this amendment. Um, Mr. Chair? Senator Crum. The way I read, are you referring to one, lines 114 to 116 on the A-10? Is that where we're? Yes, Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it says an agreement between an employer and employee requiring advance notice. So I think the time is whatever that agreement is. It would be the time, that's how I would read it. But I'm interested in your thoughts. Mr. Chair, can we offer some Senator thoughts Matt, too? Absolutely. Mr. Rochelle. I, Chair Latz and members, in addition to the concerns with number uh, six, which appears to potentially be an end run uh, around the non-compete limitation, uh, paragraph five as well is essentially just a non-compete uh, for anybody who receives equity. And that's a significant portion of um, the workforce there's been discussion about sort of income levels and whether that makes policy sense, and I'm more than happy to talk about that for as much as anybody will listen, but I'll just quickly note that um, it would directly impact or potentially directly impact medical professionals where we've already heard significant testimony today that that's a, that's a, a public health problem to impose non-competition uh, agreements in the medical profession. A lot of medical professionals are highly compensated individuals and many of them receive equity. So this would potentially be a non-compete for a, a group of people that there should not be non-competes for. Mr. Chair. Senator Umu Verbeet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have concerns about uh, these last two sections of the amendment. I also have faith in Senator Mann to, to work with the House author to make sure it aligns where necessary. I believe this has another committee stop. So I would recommend that we vote this amendment down and give the author time um, to make sure it aligns properly and does what it's intended to do. Uh, so uh, Senator Umu Verbaten, my only hesitation there is I don't want to pass the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction uh, responsibilities onto the Finance Committee to decide um, on which is which would be the next stop. But I, I do have um, the same concerns that have been raised about paragraphs five and six as to whether they could in effect crowd out or be substitute non-compete provisions. Uh, so uh, any, any other discussion on the A-10 amendment? Not seeing any. Uh, on Senator Kroon's motion to adopt the A-10 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, the motion fails. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. Uh, Chair. Senator Kroon. I'd like to make a, uh, another amendment based on the A-10 amendment without sections 5 and 6. So we're going, to allow, we're going to allow this, but I'm going to give you the right procedure to do it. Um, so we'll accommodate your your uh, your effort to have this considered, Senator Crew. In, the, uh, in committee, you don't have to have voted on the prevailing side to bring a motion to reconsider. So Senator Crew moves to reconsider 
uh, the vote whereby the A-10 amendment was not adopted. Um, doing a formal vote on that motion. Okay, so I think we need procedurally need to have a formal vote on the motion to reconsider. Um, and that would just um, bring us back to the A-10 amendment. Um, before it was adopted, then you could move, you could strike the prov provisions that you would like us to strike from it for further consideration. So on Senator Kuhn's motion to reconsider the vote by which the A-10 amendment was not adopted, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. We have before us the A-10 amendment. Again, uh, Senator Kruin uh, moves uh, to amend the A-10 amendment by deleting lines 1.12 to 1.16. That's correct. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, except for the last, well, no, the final quotation mark is not new language. All right. So yeah, and Mr. Chair, I think the, Senator Kruin, the semicolon on 111 would be a period. Would be a period. All right. Mr. Chair. We got that. Senator Mann, what are your thoughts on this? We also have concerns on number three. <laughs> Too broadly drafted? Yes. Mr. Chair, members, that's, Mr. Rochelle. that's begging for litigation for a court to interpret what interfere with means. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's exactly what courts are for. And quite frankly, this whole area of law has an extensive um, decisions and um, built up over time. And uh, I think courts are more than capable of handling this type of uh, contract interpretation. Mr. Chair. Senator Matt. Um, I think what continually happens during the conversation of this bill is that we sit around and talk like a bunch of lawyers and we remove the people at the center of the bill, right? If you have an employee who is not a lawyer and their employer says, you have interfered with my business relationships, that employee has no, doesn't know what that means, doesn't know what they can and cannot do with that. Um, and it's that constant threat of taking away someone's livelihood. That, that's what we're trying to prevent here. And again, this person is not going to sit around a room with a bunch of lawyers having the discussion, right? They're going to say, okay, and then they're going to go on their way. So yes, the courts can do what the courts do and the lawyers can do what they do, but that's not what the point of the bill is. And we're, we're losing sight of that. Chief Author had the final word on the A-10 Amendment as amended. All those in favor of adopting the A-10 Amendment as amended say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The amendment does not prevail. Or the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members, to the uh, final bill um, before us, Senate File 405 as amended. Uh, Senator Umu Verbaten recommends that 405 as Mr. amended Chair? be recommended to pass. Senator Kroon. I would like to uh, make an oral amendment um, to put the, uh, the, uh, the compensation threshold into the bill. I don't have a written amendment prepared. But Well, Senator Kroon, you have to give us a little more specifics yes. than simply saying the, com the compensation threshold. So what it would be would be to uh, delete paragraph A from the current language on 1.19 to 1.20. Then insert in paragraph A um, You know what? Um, I don't think this is ready. So I'll withdraw the amendment. Senator Umu Verbaten moves that Senate File 405 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No, no. Motion prevails. Uh, Senator Mann, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Michelle, you're, I think you're done in front of the judiciary for today. <laughs> we will welcome you back at any time.
So members, we're gonna make a bit of an adjustment here. We're gonna take up Senator Seaburger's bill next and we're gonna be able to, we've got the room until three o'clock. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish it by then. Uh, Senator Westland's Senate file 1191 is going to be uh, postponed. Um, and uh, we'll probably add it to Friday's agenda or if not one of the agendas next week. Uh, it will come back, we'll let you know. Um, and uh, uh, same with Senate file 1507 at this point. Uh, I think Senator Mitchell might have been tied up with something else and Secretary of State Simon um, apparently has been notified that <laughs> the other bills were taken a while because he hasn't appeared here yet. Uh, so Senate file 1507 will also be removed from today's agenda um, unless they show up and we have a few minutes before three o'clock to, to take that. To Senate file 1988, I'm going to encourage, I've got uh, seven people signed up to testify. Um, if you can please be succinct in your testimony, we will have a chance of finishing it today. If you aren't, uh, we will not finish it today and we'll have to come back. Uh, Senator Sieber, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Today on job sites across Minnesota, one in five workers is likely to experience being misclassified, paid off the books, and or have their wages stolen. While we passed an effective law addressing wage theft in 2019, the issue remains prevalent and we think this bill will help clean up the construction industry. Senate file 1988 will ensure that construction workers subjected to wage theft have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors, and to incentivize the hiring of responsible contractors by placing the responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with the most control over construction labor practices. Contractors engaging in the subcontracting of labor on their construction projects are liable for the unpaid wages and damages stemming therefrom of the subcontractors performing work under their control. I am proud to carry this bill, and it is a passion of mine to stand up for workers who are being exploited. We are pleased to be joined by supporters, workers, and other groups who support this legislation, and I am looking forward to their testimony um, and that it will be brief. Um, I do have an amendment um, that is the product of negotiation between the stakeholders, between and among the stakeholders, as this bill has moved through um, various stops, and it is the A8 amendment. Numbers of the amendments being handed out. I would like to make an oral amendment to this. To your oral amendment, Senator Seaberger. Thank you. On line 1.3, after the word contractor, add the words or subcontractor. That will be incorporated into the A8 amendment. Uh, Thank you. To the amendment, go ahead and uh, do you want to adopt that now before the testimony? Yes, please. Can you please describe the amendment as it's not your first committee stop? Yes. So the A8 um, uh, amendment represents some clarifications and uh, agreements made among the stakeholders with regard to um, collective bargaining agreements on jobs um, and then includes in the definition of employer a contractor that is assumed a subcontractor's liability within the meaning of 181-165. So it cleans things up and clarifies understandings among the parties. Any discussion on the A8 amendment? Not seeing any, uh, Senator Seaberger moves adoption of the A8 amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. Any further a predicate to the testimony we're going to hear, Senator Seaberger? No, I'm ready to move forward with my testifiers. All right. Uh, Adam Dunnick, you're first on the list. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Adam Dunnick. I'm here on behalf of the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. I'll do my best to be brief. In summary, Senate file 1988 will ensure that construction workers subject to wage theft have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors. General contractors and project owners will see the necessity to hire responsible subcontractors by placing the responsibility to a responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with the most control over their construction labor practices in their job sites. Compliance would be incentivized. Some may ask why are we working on another wage theft related bill this session, session since one was just passed in 2019. The biggest reason is that we haven't seen much change in the construction industry since the law was passed. Approximately half of the multifamily work we see in wood frame, drywall, and other scopes of work 
are still being performed by subcontractors who pay cash under the table. And in some ways, it took a high-profile case of alleged wage theft for us to consider this legislation. The workers that, who worked at Viking Lakes in Egan and across other projects in the Twin Cities were owed thousands of dollars over a period of not just months, but years. The current law wasn't working for them. But it isn't about just one general contractor or one developer. Unfortunately, there are many who are breaking the rules and benefiting from the status quo. And who is losing? The workers. And I want to thank some of the workers that have been speaking out, both in prior committees as well as in the, the newspaper this weekend. I hope you had a chance to read that. They are stepping out from the shadows and saying things like, it is taking too long to get answers. We want support and we want justice. We believe that the best enforcement in wage theft and paying workers off the book is, books is to have compliance. And the best way to ensure that there's uh, that that happens is for general contractors to be liable for the workers on their sites and that they're paid. Our goal is not for a bunch of contractors to be caught breaking the law. Our goal is actually for contractors to do the right thing, to hire subcontractors who have real payrolls, employees who are on the books, not cutting corners. This uh, legislation in front of you has a huge uh, ability to make that big difference in a lot of people's lives, and I urge your support for Senate File 1988. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunning. Uh, we have Matt Capici on virtual testimony. I hope I pronounced your name right, sir. Uh, if you want to go ahead, uh, state your full name, that's affiliation, the, and your testimony. That's a non-anglicized pronunciation. Um, I've been listening all day today. <laughs> yes, I have. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Capice. I'm a representative of the General President of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. Uh, Chair Latz and committee members, thank you for allowing me to, to speak today in support of Senate File 1988. Since 1989, my work has focused on the illegal employment practices in the construction industry. I speak in favor of the bill because it is designed to protect workers by instituting a model in effect in several other states. You will hear, hear testimony from opponents about how general contractors are not responsible for what happens after they subcontract work. Frankly, that is exactly why we need this bill to become law. You will also hear technical critiques about the bill couched in the misunderstanding that it is an exercise in contract or construction law. It is not. This is a labor bill that changes the obligations of general contractors by design to protect workers. Wage theft remains a serious problem in the construction industry, impacting workers, taxpayers, as well as honest contractors. A 2010 study by the Midwest Economic Policy Institute estimated that 23% of Minnesota's construction workforce is misclassified. Accordingly, workers lose $29,700 per year and taxpayers well over $100 million a year. The Advocates for Human Rights, a well-respected immigrant rights organization, recommended in its 2016 report on curbing trafficking and exploitation in Minnesota's workplaces to amend wage and hour laws to ensure that companies that employ subcontractors and independent contractors cannot shield themselves from responsibility for the treatment of their workers. These reports and studies, in my experience, confirms that immigrants and workers of color are disproportionately impacted by wage theft. Wage theft in the construction industry is done by design. The industry has adopted a successful and profitable exploitation model. Workers are frequently paid entirely off the books by subcontractors or their labor brokers and are often that are often third or fourth tier. Labor brokers exist to facilitate lower labor costs through an off-the-books payroll that allows contractors to steal work away from law-abiding competitors while giving a shield against liability. Labor, these labor brokers are undercapitalized and operate in the shadows. They receive lump sum payments, then distribute, each, then distribute the cash payments without tax withholdings, proper workers' compensation insurance premium payments, or overtime. And if ever confronted by law enforcement, the brokers are easily replaced by the upper tier contractors. I refer the committee to the criminal prosecution of Ricardo Batres for labor trafficking and workers' compensation premium fraud, but we simply cannot prosecute our way out of this problem. Every time a prosecution or enforcement action begins and ends with a labor broker or other lower tier subcontractor 
The industry's malign exploitation model is vindicated. The industry needs to be incentivized to clean up its act. The bill carefully does that by cutting through the layers and placing accountability where it belongs, with the contractors at the top. This type of liability without a requirement to prove knowledge or joint employer status is not a novel concept to contractors. Similar liability exists on federal and state prevailing rate laws and the Occupational Safety and Health Act's general duty clause. I therefore respectfully urge you to support SF 1988. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Capis. Bert Johnson. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair Latz and committee members for allowing me to speak today in support of Senate File 1988. My name is Bert Johnson. I'm General Counsel for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, headquartered here in St. Paul. I've been doing that for about 17 years, and in those 17 years, no issue has presented a bigger threat to the construction industry and the health of its construction workers than wage theft and misclassification. So I speak in favor of SF 1988 because it is designed specifically to protect workers by placing that accountability for wage theft upon those in the best position to prevent it, general contractors. Minnesota's landmark 19, 2019 wage theft prevention law gives workers in DLI new tools to fight wage theft, but it fell short in one respect. It left workers in DLI to pursue wage theft but their recourse is directed toward those at the very bottom of a long chain of subcontracting, often designed to, provide, to deprive workers of wages. Simply put, to prevent wage theft in the construction industry, accountability must start at the top. Today I want to address criticism of this bill, which has fallen into three categories that you'll probably hear from. A, the first, is denial of the problem of wage theft. I'll address this one briefly. This is a false argument. And it's offensive to the marginalized workers who came forward at great risk and testified here in other committees. Read the studies, listen to the workers, ignore the deniers. Second, is the strange argument, I've never heard it before, that general contractors somehow have no control over what happens on their projects after they subcontract labor. This couldn't be further from the truth, and everyone in the industry knows it. General contractors are legally and contractually responsible for all aspects of a construction project, purchasing materials, equipment, scheduling of work, securing all the skilled constru construction labor, scheduling the project, um, every single thing that's necessary to build these projects. Subcontracting labor is a choice, it's a business decision, but it's not one that should allow the general contractor and absolve the general contractor of their responsibility to ensure that workers are paid. The last argument is that SF 1988 is, is an aberration from the norms of construction and contract law. This is not a construction or contract law bill, it's a labor bill. Um, it is specifically designed to prevent wage theft. It is similar to other laws that already exist and have been around since English common law, such as the mechanics liens, which impute liability directly to the property owner. If you think about how minimal this bill is, in relation to other laws that already impute liability either to the general contractors such as OSHA, workers' comp, or mechanics liens, which allow material suppliers or laborers to file liens on projects. So in closing, this bill is needed now more than ever. This is a labor bill, it's a worker bill. With this bill, you have an opportunity to make a big difference in the lives of construction workers. I urge you to support SF 1988 and appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'm going to ask you and Mr. Dunnick to vacate the testifier seats, please. Uh, Peter Coyle and Matthew Collins, if you come forward, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. members Coyle. of the committee, my name is Peter Coyle. I'm legislative counsel to Housing First Minnesota, the largest uh, trade association directed at the home building industry uh, in the state. I'm pleased to have a couple of minutes to speak to the bill. And respectfully, I will say at the outset, while we understand the severity of the concern that's being raised by the author and her supporters, uh, we think the bill as drafted ought not be supported by this committee. We think it's heavy handed, and we think, frankly, it ought to give the existing statute more time to perform in a manner that will allow us to see the extent of the problem that the bill, uh, as currently drafted, is trying to address. In speaking to representatives of the Department of Labor and Industry, in my efforts to try to be smarter about the problem, I was not able to substantiate 
the nature and extent of the concerns that have been raised by the advocates, including here today. That's not to say that I don't respect and accept that there are many employees, too many employees, who have been shorted on their wages, and I take those claims to be serious and worthy of redress. But respectfully, I believe this bill does not accomplish that. In fact, I think it will have the opposite effect of what the authors intend. It's going to force contractors to rely only on those subcontractors with whom they've worked for very many years and who have demonstrated financial strength that many smaller companies that are trying to break into the industry will not have established. And that's going to have a disproportionate effect on those companies that may be uh, owned and operated by those who are in disadvantaged positions, uh, whether because of their ethnicity or their um, sexual orientation. So from our point of view, this is going to have a chilling effect on the marketplace and do more harm to the opportunities that we're trying to prevent and pre present in the construction industry. And for that reason, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would urge the committee to not support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Uh, if, if you would uh, vacate the testifier seat, Brooke Bordson could come forward. And go ahead, Matthew Collins. Thank you, Chairman and the committee. My name is Matthew Collins. I'm an attorney at the Fabianski Law Firm, and I am here on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. Uh, the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota represents over 350 commercial general contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. It's the state's oldest and lar largest uh, construction association and has been in existence for 104 years. Um, the key points that I'd like to bring to the committee's attention is uh, first saying that the AGC unequivocally condemns and does not condone the practice of wage theft. Our position on SF 1988 is that the legislation is misguided and will result in many unintended consequences. I'm here to provide some context for those unintended consequences and answer any questions you may have. First, the legislation is misguided because it places legal responsibility for the criminal actions of parties that the upstream contractor does not control and lacks uh, complicity with the illegal actions involving wage theft. I've heard a lot of testimony about that the general contractor has the project under their control. They don't have uh, direct contractual privity with three and fourth tier subcontractors. They don't have control over third and fourth tier subcontractors, books and records and accounting information, withholding statements and benefit packages that these subcontractors may offer their uh, employees. They don't have the understanding of how these employees get paid. They can't. They don't have the right contractually to police third and fourth tier subcontractors. They can't go into their offices and examine their books and records to determine whether they've made payments to their employees or withheld proper withholdings. They don't have a legal right to ensure that that's happening. Um, so that is, uh, uh, from the outset, an, a hamstring to the enforcement or the ability of the general contractors to enforce this. Um, the bill further provides no path, path for upstream contractors to effectively manage the risks imposed by the downstream subs. At its core, contracting is about managing and risk and pricing risk. If, there, if it is therefore significant that because no insurance product exists to cover the liability risk imposed on upstream contractors for the criminal actions of downstream partners, upstream contractors will be left to price that risk accordingly to cover their exposure. This risk, this risk pricing will lead to potentially significant cost increases to construction services. Uh, fundamental fairness also uh, does not support the current bill as written because of the risk that a general contractor would risk having to pay twice for the labor that they've employed because a uh, bad actor downstream has stolen wages. So even though the general contractor has done everything in its power to make sure that <coughs> folks are getting paid, it still carries this risk that some bad actor down the stream it's unaware of and has no control of will require it to pay twice. 
Um, the bill also invalidates uh, contractual indemnification claims for payments to workers. Most construction contracts require the lower tier subcontractors to indemnify general contractors if there is wage theft. This bill uh, eliminates that. And then uh, to follow up with Mr. Doyle's uh, comments, the, in talking to um, uh, general contractors and subcontractors, what they fear most is the barriers this will uh, uh, create to small businesses and those businesses who are trying to break into the construction industry. Because the general contractors aren't going to risk liability for this uh, potential um, uh, wage theft. So they are going to uh, hire well-regarded subcontractors, folks they've been dealing with for years and years. And also, they'll start requiring payment bonds. Um, this will force smaller uh, businesses to uh, uh, purchase payment bonds. Um, they may be priced out of the market because they can't obtain the, uh, they don't have the credit worthiness to obtain payment bonds to ensure that payments are being made to their workers. So this also will have a, a detrimental effect on um, uh, growing the construction industry so that more uh, people in uh, society can participate in, in this uh, industry. In closing, wage theft is wrong, making people responsible for criminal acts of others who, over who they have no knowledge or influence is also wrong. Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments and observations. I'm available for any questions you may have. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, can John uh, Besh come forward? Uh, take the seat that uh, Mr. Collins is going to vacate, and Brooke Bordson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Brooke Bordson. I'm with the League of Minnesotas, which represents 837 cities across the state. And I will just briefly touch on a concern um, from cities about the bill. Under the new definitions in the bill, a city as a project owner could be deemed a contractor in certain circumstances and liable for all claims as such. Um, because public projects are funded with taxpayer dollars, municipalities are subject to unique requirements under the state's Chapter 471 Uniform Municipal Contracting Law and other statutes. These requirements include a sealed bidding process and acceptance of the lowest responsible bid and obtaining performance and payment bonds for certain public projects. Um, in the contractor's bonds for public work law in 574.26, um, public projects over $175,000 uh, require a payment bond. For projects where a payment bond has been obtained, subcontractors and workers can make a claim against the bond for wages that they're owed. We would request that language be added to the bill stating that these new provisions would not supersede recourse under the payment bond when a city has required a contractor to provide a payment bond. Without this clarification, there may be some confusion about whether a claimant would file two claims for payment from the city owner or under the bond and how those claims uh, would be reconciled. Um, I'll leave my comments there, but did want to thank Senator Seberger and the advocates and uh, Mr. Dunnick for continuing to discuss this uh, with us and happy to work with everyone moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Bordson. Uh, John Besh. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee for the record, my name is John Beshi. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding Senate File 1988. Uh, ABC is fundamentally opposed to the idea that general contractors should be required to assume the liability for unpaid paid wages and benefit claims that are brought against a subcontractor of any tier. Senate file 1988 paints all general contractors with a broad stroke by implying that general contractors are bad actors who are engaged in intentional efforts to commit wage theft. This assumption of liability is unfair to general contractors who have no knowledge of what may have transpired between subcontractors and their employees or even what will happen in the future. The general contractor does not sit on the HR or accounting divisions of the dozens and dozens of subcontractors that they work with on every single project. With no showing of intent required to impose this liability on a general contractor, the ultimate effect of this bill will be to punish innocent parties for the bad actions of others. Uh, 
It's been said that this bill is needed to tilt the playing field so that it is even between general contractors and employees. However, it's interesting that this approach seems to only apply to merit shop general contractors as the bill explicitly permits the assumption of liability to be waived by a collective bargaining agreement with the trade union. In contrast, all other general contractors are expressly prohibited from obtaining an agreement by a subcontractor for the indemnification or transfer of this liability. Talk about an uneven playing field. The natural result of this will be that merit shop contractors will avoid entering into contracts with union subcontractors out of fear that they will need to assume the liability of unpaid wages on behalf of the union subcontractor. This bill also creates an explicit carve out for prevailing wage projects. Uh, does the fact that a project pays prevailing wage really mean that wage theft is less likely to occur? The answer is no. In a recent article in the Star Tribune, that, which touched on the first criminal charges against an employer for wage theft, it was a project that paid prevailing wage. Um, if this is a problem that we're trying to address, one would think that the same requirements should apply to union job sites and prevailing wage projects as well. However, this bill creates an uneven playing field where certain general contractors are forced to assume liability while others are free to conduct business as usual. I want to be clear that ABC does not condone wage theft and we do believe that every worker deserves to get paid. When the 2019 wage theft bill was signed into law, the advocates celebrated it as one of the toughest wage theft laws in the country. It was supposed to provide the Department of Labor and the Attorney General with the tools needed to crack down on wage theft, and it created criminal liability for intentional fraudulent wage theft. Rather than create an unfair system where liability flows upstream regardless of knowledge or intent, we would like to see the Department of Labor and the Attorney General enforce the wage theft laws that are on the books. In closing, we urge the committee to vote no on Senate File 1988. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. That concludes the testimony from all those who signed up ahead of time. Is there anyone else in the room that wishes to testify in connection with this bill? I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, members, our, our jurisdiction here kind of overlaps with the previous uh, committee, uh, the Labor Committee. We've got there's some liability stuff in here, including the assumption of, of liability, which has been the focus of most of the testimony here. There's some civil liability provisions. There's the Attorney General Office enforcement um, of uh, the provisions here as well. So uh, we're, we're uh, in a sense, we're revisiting all of the policy questions in the underlying bill, but uh, maybe with a Judiciary Committee eye uh, toward it. Um, is there any discussion from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had one quick question before I go on to my next comment. Um, I've been told that uh, individual homeowners can act as a general contractor. Does this bill affect that individual if they act as a general contractor and hire their own subs to do work on their own homestead? Senator Seaberger. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Dunnick to address that concern. Mr. Dunnick. Mr. Chair and Senator Lewis, the answer is no, uh, not under the definitions of, of owners. Uh, we specifically laid out, I think it's uh, uh, homeowners under two units or less, correct? It's 10 units or less. 10, 10, 10 in, units in, or less. in a year, under 10 units of housing. So an individual homeowner could not be liable if they're doing work on their own home and hiring subs direct. All right. Thank Senator you. Limmer. Thank you. Uh, on another subject. Uh, Thank you, Justifiers. Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the A9 amendment. The amendment's been distributed to the members of the committee. Uh, Senator Limmer, explain your amendment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this amendment bypasses the approach in the bill for wage theft claims against residential contractors only. 
um, rather than making workers go through the litigation, complicated, complicated, maybe slow process to pursue a wage theft claim, this amendment would provide a much more streamlined method to review a worker's claim, and it would be not by a court, but by the Department of Labor and Industry, uh, Dolly, and pay the claim if found valid. The uh, funds can come from the uh, contractor recovery fund. Now, for those of you who don't know that, uh, there's a fee that's collected by every licensed contractor um, that has a license in the state. It's much like uh, those that are real estate agents, they too have a recovery fund. And in this case, contractor recovery fund is, is uh, managed by Dolly, and, and like I said, they're, they're funded by the annual license renewal. Uh, I think this, this, resi this if it's just focused on residential licensed contractors, it provides a more efficient, reliable way, probably a lot quicker too, to solve a problem of wage theft in the state. So I'll open it up for discussion, Mr. Chair. Senator Sieber, your thoughts on the A9 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer, thank you for um, approaching me ahead of time with this amendment and giving me a little bit of time to read it, review it, um, process it, and fully understand it. Um, I've had an opportunity to kind of take a deep dive into the Contractor Recovery Fund, and this is what I learned. That the way it operates is, well, first of all, the purpose of the contract, Contractor Recovery Fund is to compensate owners of residential real estate um, for problems that occur on the job, which is a different purpose from compensating workers who have had their wages stolen. But I think more significantly, the current statutory requirements to access the funds under this uh, recovery fund is that you need to obtain a final judgment um, in a court. So we're not talking about a quick process here. I think the, 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 the amendment as it's written um, seems to ind indicate that it would only take 60 days, and that's not the case. You have to obtain a final judicial determination and then submit that to the fund for recovery, um, which I think frustrates the process both behind um, the intent of the recovery fund and this bill, which is to get at wage theft. Um, the, this amendment would also um, uh, conflict with the terms of the statute 326B.89, which uh, speaks to the contractor recovery fund, which states that the commissioner shall only pay compensation from the fund for a final judgment that's based on a contract directly between the contractor and the homeowner. Um, so this would not allow payment of a claim that would result in a contract between the contractor and an employee. So I think there's a lot of problems with this amendment. I don't think it streamlines things quite the way Senator Limmer envisions. Um, and I would urge a no vote on this amendment. Mr. Chairman. Senator Limmer. Mr. Chair, we're kind of, uh, <clears throat> we're kind of uh, considering new territory for this fund. And quite honestly, I think this is a great opportunity to protect wages with this fund. Uh, I kind of explored into this area myself, and quite honestly, I think it's a perfect way to take care of at least those that are residential contractors. In most cases, in the single, single home contracting up to uh, what are the two or four units, uh, most of those are not union workers anywhere in the state. That's, that's been given up a long time ago, historically. Uh, there may be particular subs, plumbers, electricians, that may still have a un union card. But other than that, the subcontractor and, uh, and the contractors are independent people that are just making a living putting up houses. And um, I thought this would be a good way to explore to uh, propose in order to streamline for that type of contractor. Um, litigation doesn't always uh, restore the individual uh, plaintiff uh, to the full amount 
when you're dealing with uh, uh, attorney fees and other things. So uh, quite honestly, and, and I, as much as I've questioned the Dolly commissioners over the years, uh, I think they're very uh, sensitive to worker needs. They're very sensitive to labor, and they should be. And so I would have uh, every confidence in a Dolly commissioner quickly restoring the, uh, the damage uh, that could happen in a wage theft claim. So. Any further discussion on the A9 amendment? Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just, this isn't a question. Um, it's responding to Senator Seberger's point about 326B.89, not necessarily meshing with this amendment. And um, that, that could be the case. And I'm just wondering, uh, it's an interesting concept. I'm, I'm not sure if three, it might require an amendment of 326B.89 to accomplish its purpose. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Senator Sieber. Uh Mr. Chair, that, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, Senator Cruin, you know, I'd be happy to talk about that with you on, an, on another bill. Um, but I don't think that uh, amending this particular bill, 1988, to try to kind of shoehorn it within the confines of 326B89 is appropriate. And I will point out that the contractor recovery fund balance is currently at about $9.5 million. Um, in, if even 10 to 20 residential building contractors fail and the fund has to pay out to consumers, um, it would bankrupt the fund. The, by law, the contractor recovery fund can pay out up to $550,000 on behalf of a single contractor through individual, home, um, though individual homeowners can collect no more than $75,000. So there's, there's uh, limits placed on what can be recovered. Um, the fund balance is only 9.5 million. I don't think this is a, a useful way to um, tap into this fund. I don't think we should get creative at this point. Um, but if Senator Kroon, you want to talk about ways we could we could um, work with that fund on another bill, I'd be happy to do that. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wasn't suggesting that we be creative on the spot and do it as part of this bill. I guess uh, my point was that in order to do this concept, it seems like it would have we'd have to take a more comprehensive view um, and bring 326B.89 into the conversation. It would be a pretty uh, big process, I guess. And I also have concerns about. I don't know. I'm not. I don't have familiar with the details as you're laying them out on this particular fund. But there's there are other funds too that I'm thinking. Um, for registered property, Torrance property has a fund, and sometimes it's 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 hard to access those, um, and 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 so that would need to be looked at too to make it a very user friendly. And it sounds like we would meet, need to look at the, the fund balance issue as well. So, but I the concept is interesting though. But it seems like there's there'd be a lot of work that sure. would need to be done to do it. Senator Lemon, last comment on your amendment. Thank you. I'm curious, as I uh, work on this issue, uh, what would be the demand? Uh, you, you mentioned the balance of nine and a half million in the contractor recovery fund. What is the demand of, of uh, wage theft claim right now? How many cases are pending? A uh, dollar amount, if you can Senator Seberger, if you know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer, I do not know. Does anyone know what yeah, the test Senator Limmer. Uh, I believe the Department of Labor and Industry is here who could maybe offer some insight. Uh, members, while the Dolly representative is arriving, uh, I regret I have to go because I have to be somewhere. Um, but uh, we're going to have Senator Umu Verbaten conclude the hearing. Um, and if people are able to stay, we'll try to fit in Senator Mitchell, Senate file 1507, if that's going to go real quick after we're done. I know people have to get to some other committees as well. So thank you, members. Thank you for being here. Can you state your um, name and title for the record? Hi, I'm Josiah Moore. I'm the legislative coordinator at the Department of Labor and Industry. 
Uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Weimer, for your question. Uh, if the question is about wage theft uh, complaints for the Contractor Recovery Fund, as it stands, uh, we don't take complaints of that nature to the Contractor Recovery Fund at this time. Uh, if the question is about, in our labor standards unit that takes wage theft complaints, how many cases we have active, uh, I don't have that number in front of me, but I can follow up with you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other discussion? We do have the A9 amendment before us. Senator Lummer. Thank you, Senator Lummer. Uh, so on to the um, underlying bill as amended. Any other comments, questions? Okay, final words, Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wage theft continues to be a problem. This bill will help solve that problem. I urge you to vote in favor of this bill. Thank you very much. Okay, and with that, Senator Seeberger, um, You'll make a motion to uh, pass uh, or to for Senate File 1988 as amended to be recommended to pass and sent to finance. So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. The motion is adopted. It's on its way to finance.